Welcome to worship the second Sunday after Pentecost with Peace Lutheran Church out of Austin, Texas and the whole Southwestern Texas Synod. The Synod is gathering in assembly this weekend and so in a moment we will transition to join the wider church for worship. Uh, the Synod Assembly is a gathering of voting members from across all the congregations in Southwestern Texas where we've been making decisions about our shared life and ministry together and celebrating what that has been and looking to the future. Thank you for keeping the Synod in your prayers this weekend. A few things about peace these days. You'll see VBS videos dropping every day this coming week for any young people in your lives to engage as they wish, either on the day or later. And we hope that many people will be able to join our virtual VBS called for such a time as this, which has been a collaboration with Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Austin. There are many other things that are in the weekly email. I won't go through all of them uh, today, other than to say I'll be at outdoor office hours on the patio this Thursday from 12.30 to 2.30. And I just want to say thank you in advance because this coming week we will begin quite a few behind the scenes technology transitions for worship, which means that things will hopefully be amazing and beautiful, but also maybe a little bumpy at times. So thank you for bearing with us as we transition the technology we use to be able to worship virtually and also add in in-person worship. We hope that uh, we will be able to invite people in person on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Starting perhaps as early as June 20th, an official notice will be sent confirming that once we know we have our technology in place. But we would love it if you plan and hope to be in person on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. If you could email us or call us at the office, um, office at peaceaustin.org is the email. It will help us make sure that we are planning properly um, if we have at least an idea of how many folks hope to be coming in person right away. We will continue to be working to maintain a great virtual option as well for anyone that needs to connect from a distance, either as you are traveling this summer or as, as you remain home and, um, and come out of relative isolation from the pandemic at the pace that works for you. So I invite you now to prepare your space, your hearts, um, your spirit for worship as we join the rest of the Synod. Welcome.
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sins, the fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our light, and our salvation. Amen. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
Let us pray. Merciful God, the fountain of living water, you quench our thirst and you wash away our sin. Give us this water always. Bring us to drink from the well that flows with the beauty of your truth through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. La primera lectura la tomamos del libro de Éxodo, capítulo 17 y versos del 1 al 7. Toda la congregación de los hijos de Israel partió del desierto de Sin por sus jornadas, conforme al mandamiento de Yahvé, y acamparon en Refidim, y no había agua para que el pueblo bebiese. Y atercó el pueblo con Moisés y dijeron, Danos agua para que bebamos. Y Moisés les dijo, ¿Por qué altercáis conmigo? ¿Por qué tentáis a Yahvé? Así que el pueblo tuvo allí sed y murmuró contra Moisés y dijo, ¿Por qué nos hiciste subir de Egipto para matarnos de sed a nosotros, a nuestros hijos y a nuestros ganados? Entonces clavó Moisés a Yahvé diciendo, ¿Qué haré con este pueblo? De aquí a poco me apedrarán. Y Yahvé dijo a Moisés, Pasa delante del pueblo y toma contigo de los ancianos de Israel y toma también en tu mano tu vara con que golpeaste el río y ve. Y he aquí que yo estaré delante de ti allí sobre la peña de Oreb y golpearás la peña y saldrá de ella agua y beberá el pueblo. Y Moisés lo hizo así en presencia de los ancianos de Israel. Y llamó el nombre de aquel lugar Masá y Meriba, por la rencilla de los hijos de Israel y porque tentaron a Yahvé diciendo, ¿Está pues Yahvé entre nosotros o no? Palabra de Dios, palabra de vida, gracias a Dios. Psalm 95 will be read responsively by whole verse. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before God's presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to the Lord with psalms. For you, Lord, are a great God and a great ruler above all gods. In your hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also yours. The sea is yours, for you made it, and your hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For the Lord is our God, and we are the people of God's pasture and the sheep of God's hand. Oh, that today you would hear God's voice. Harden not your hearts as at Meribah, as on that day at Massa, in the desert. There your ancestors tested me. They put me to the test, though they had seen my works. Forty years I loathed that generation, saying, The heart of this people goes astray. They do not know my ways. Indeed, I swore in my anger, they shall never come to my rest. Here ends the psalm. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the fourth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. The disciples left him to go into the city for food. It was about noon when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Give me a drink. How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? You Jews do not share things in common with us Samaritans. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you the great... Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, 
who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband. You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your hus husband. What you have said is true. Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then, his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Upon the disciples' return, the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? The Samaritans left their city and were on their way to him. Rabbi, eat something. I have food to eat that you do not know about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. And when they came to him, they asked him to stay with them. He stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you have said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Welcome, Reverend Dr. Santos. It is so good to be with you today as we dwell together in this rich story of the Samaritan woman at the well. Thank you so much, Bishop. It is really an honor to be here um, as part of this uh, assembly of the Southwest uh, Texas Synod. And uh, please receive greetings uh, from the office of the presiding bishop where I have the honor to serve. Uh, bishop, will you open us in prayer? Certainly, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, today we pray that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts would always be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Bishop. You know, I was um, reflecting on your invitation to do this uh, sermon as a dialogue. And uh, I was uh, reminded of something that I was taught by my elders uh, in the faith. And is that the sermon is a conversation between God and the people. Mm -hmm. And that uh, it is the way in which God speaks to the heart of the people, or God speaks to the, uh, to the questions, the deep questions that people are asking, the anxieties, the yearnings, the struggles of the people. And so when you prepare a sermon, they, they say you need to have the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other hand so that you know what is happening. And so I wonder, Bishop, if we should begin 
by <clears throat> reflecting on what is uh, happening in your sin, what are some of those existential questions and journeys and dreams that you are hearing uh, from the people that you lead in your sin? Thank you so much for asking. I would say there are at least two big questions that I'm hearing now, either implicitly or explicitly expressed. The first is, how can we be more faithful followers of Jesus in our current context which is so amazingly multicultural and diverse. And yet most of our congregations are pretty monocultural and white. So how can we translate the gospel of grace in ways that can touch the lives of these diverse communities that are surrounding our congregations? Because the gospel as understood by our Lutheran tradition is so powerful and can truly bring about liberation. And the second question that I hear a lot is what will the church look like as we return in person? Who will come back? What will we be like? Mm. You know, because of my uh, position serving with church, what I get to see what's going on around the church. And uh, I have to say that those questions are resonating throughout the entire uh, territory uh, of our church. Um, but what I also find interesting is the way in which uh, the biblical text sometimes uh, help us understand those questions because they, there were people that were already asking similar questions uh, during biblical times. And the text that we have for today is not the exception. Mm -hmm. you know, that conversation that Jesus had with the Samaritan woman takes place in Samaria. And Samaria has a really... Um, complicated but interesting uh, history. Uh, in the year 722, um, they were still a part of Israel, but then they were invaded by the Assyrians. And then the Assyrians destroyed the city and they sent into exile the majority of the residents. And then they brought uh, foreigners, they brought people from with different cultures, uh, with different religions to populate that area. And throughout the centuries, there were many things that were complicated, but the result was a, a, a gap open between them and their, and their siblings uh, to the south, uh, the Jewish people. And so they were, uh, they were treated uh, as foreigners, even though they were in their own land. And uh, they were treated um, as not fully uh, members of the faith, even though they also participated in the rich tradition and the rich background uh, that they had. And so they were dealing with questions in Samaria, the Samaritans, they were dealing with questions of, 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 of after the exile, who will come back? What will, what, how will things look like for us now? They were asking questions like, what is the right way to worship? Is it at Mount Gerizim where we have our, our own temple or do we have to go to Jerusalem? What is the right way to do things? And I think that those are very similar questions uh, to the ones that we uh, that you mentioned and the ones that our people um, are asking uh, in the pews, especially in your in your uh, in the territory of your of your synod, where there is really the, that rich mix of cultures and people and uh, histories of migration and so on and so forth. Um, I think that one of the things that makes the Bible so powerful is that it's not just the word of God, but it's also the word of the people. It, it amplifies those questions, those existential questions that people are asking. And sometimes it does so in a way that is um, so honest, uh, that, uh, that is helpful. But what do you see, uh, Bishop? What do you see in this uh, biblical text that uh, speaks to the reality of, of the people that you serve in your synod? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about what it meant for this woman to be so excited about what had just happened to her that she left her bucket at the well and went running back to her hometown to tell her neighbors about Jesus. And what did it mean that she no longer felt she had to hide from them or to wear a mask? She was liberated to be fully herself. And speaking of liberation, since you mentioned that you have taught liberation theology, what do you look at when you see this text through, through a lens of liberation theology and decolonizing theologies in the context of this synod? 
there's so much we would need like 10 sermons <laughs> to be able to unpack all of it. But uh, you talk about liberation theology and uh, for those that are not familiar with that, that is just a way of doing theology that was born uh, among the poor and, and the oppressed, especially in Latin America in the 60s uh, and also in the US among the black uh, community. And it is a theology that pays a special attention to the power of the gospel to bring a holistic liberation. It's interesting because in Greek, the word for salvation includes liberation, includes healing, includes uh, spiritual salvation. It's all of it together. But in English, we, we divide it. And it is a theology that also takes uh, particular uh, attention to the way that sin uh, shows up, uh, not only in individual acts, but also in systems in society. Uh, and so people can be oppressed, can be captive because of political systems, because of economic systems. Uh, but one very uh, interesting way in which sin uh, makes us captive is through a psychological mechanism that precisely functions by way of uh, putting on masks, so to speak, on people. Uh, and, uh, and, and so in interactions with those that are different than you, uh, you project a mask onto their face uh, so that you never really get to know them as they really are. You only see the mask, which is uh, a stereotype, which is something that you have learned from your culture uh, growing up from, from, from what you heard, have heard from people. And so one of the things that, uh, that, that, that happens is that when you look at the mask, you also have a script that will tell you how you're supposed to interact with that person. Should I ignore that person? Should I just walk around, right? The gospel says that, um, that, uh, that, that you wish people in that time and place, uh, obviously not today, that they didn't even uh, exchange uh, things. They didn't share things, have things in common uh, with the Samaritans. So you see the mask and then immediately you have a script of how you're supposed to act. Now what liberation theology tells us is that the gospel, when you light, when you shine the light of the gospel, on, on, on those situations, uh, those masks all of a sudden become uh, revealed uh, to you. You realize that that is a mask, that that is a lie, that that is not the way things are intended to be. And not only do you put those masks on others, but sometimes we put them on ourselves. That's what we see with the women, right? We have the dimension of gender justice in this, um, in this uh, text as well. Uh, we're told that the women uh, was going to a well that, according to biblical historians, was really far away from the village uh, where she was. It was near the border. And we're also told that she went there uh, at noon when it was the hottest. Now, why was she at the well at that time and so far away? Some people think that maybe she was um, trying to stay away from the other women at the well because of the gossip about her husband's. But of course, a woman in those days had no power to decide who she was married to or not. And so she was, uh, in a sense, escaping from that oppression. She was hiding with her mask. And then what do we see that happens? What we see that happens is that there's an encounter that liberates her from that mask, an encounter with Jesus. But that encounter is very interesting because it is an encounter with a stranger. She encounters Jesus as somebody who had crossed the border. Well, we don't know if he did it with permission or without permission or what type of documentation he had. But he's a sojourner. He's a foreigner. He's traveling across the border. And he approaches her as somebody in need, as somebody thirsty. And he asks her, can I have a drink? And at this moment, she's treated as a human being because Jesus was not supposed to talk to her as a rabbi, as a Jewish rabbi, and her being a woman, but he does. He treats her as a human, and she, in, he begins to remove the mask that was imprisoning her. And then in the process, she removes the mask that she had been projecting onto the Jewish people as oppressors for her. And so in that exchange with the other, she is transformed. She is liberated. And then she goes back to that thing that she was hiding away from, the same people. And then she's able to show up with her face as she really is. And then she can bear witness to the power of the gospel to bring liberation. And then she brings people to Jesus. And she says, come, could this be, could this be uh, the Messiah, the liberator, 
that be, we have been uh, waiting for. Um, but Bishop, uh, I, I get a little bit excited, and, and, and like I said, I, I need ten sermons uh, to to go into into any depth uh, about this. But as I speak about Jesus crossing the border, I am mindful of the fact that you live and you serve uh, in a in a in a border uh, state. But I'm also mindful of the fact that I, of a story that you share with me that um, that you also. Uh, uh, have an experience of crossing borders and, uh, and, and without permission, that you had an experience of being in this country um, without official permission. Um, and, um, and the reason I ask is because when I was uh, spending some time with your, uh, with your Senate Council and we were exploring this text, there was a, a gentleman that brought up the, the, the fact that wells were places of encounter and that we can think of our personal experiences as those wells where we can encounter others and have points of commonality. And so Bishop, would you mind telling us a little bit about that uh, experience and also how that has served as a point of contact, a point of connection with others? Absolutely, thank you. So uh, some of you know that I immigrated from Canada uh, in the late seventies. My father got a job in Miami and he had always valued what he saw as the U.S. values that hard work can get you anywhere. And so we were excited to move down there. And we came into Miami at a time when there was also a backlog of um, asylum seekers coming from Haiti and Cuba. And so our, um, our green card didn't materialize as we had hoped, and we ended up overstaying our visa. And my parents had promised my brother and I that we could go back to Canada to visit our friends that summer. And we really didn't think anything of getting on a plane and going there. But when we tried to get back in the country, we were stopped at the border in Toronto before we could cross. It was probably the most terrifying thing I've had in my life. I didn't, this was the day before cell phones, right? And so uh, my brother and I were stuck in Toronto. We had come from London, Ontario. Uh, but thankfully, we were able to get somebody that could help us. Um, my father got his friends from London to drive us, drive to Toronto, and then drive us across the border in Detroit. And then from there, we were able to get a plane ride to Miami. But, you know, that incident has stuck with me today. And I, I have never forgotten even the name of the officer that stopped us because it was so impactful to me. We were able later to get our green cards and to get our citizenship, but it, it was a, a harrowing journey for me. And I still remember as well, the immense sense of relief and gratitude at being rescued from our predicament. But you know, it didn't really come to me until many years later when I came here to Texas to do this work. And I started to learn about the reasons that people cross our Southern border in our Synod. It was then I started to get a glimpse of the incredible amount of privilege that I have enjoyed simply because of the family that I was born into and the color of my skin and the education I've been able to receive and the opportunities that have been available to me. Oh, don't get me wrong. We worked very hard for all that we were given, but at the same time, we had a really comfortable life in Canada. We never had to worry about escaping violence or going hungry. It was pure grace that we were able to come and stay here and that my brothers and my border crossing didn't end up with us being permanently shut out of the US away from our parents. And when we came to the U.S., we bought into the story that we belonged here because we fit in. I remember people saying to me upon hearing that I was an immigrant, they said, funny, you don't look like an immigrant. And at the time, I laughingly agreed with them because I think the mask that I was wearing was, as long as I look like this, then I belong, right? But as I've been able to reflect on that experience, particularly here in the border synod that we live in, I think about what does an immigrant look like? 
I've been dwelling in that question for a while now. I had grown up assuming that somehow those with my color skin belonged here, but those with different skin colors like yours, Reverend Santos, somehow did not. Even though here in Texas, people with your color skin were here long before people with my color skin, right? And so I've been learning uh, and educating myself on the reasons that people immigrate here from other countries and the history of Texas and the ways in which um, we displaced people that came before us. And I've been learning also about some of the history of some of the countries in Central and South America and the ways in which they've been negatively impacted by US policies and climate change that have led to their issues of violence and poverty and famine. Because the more I learn as well, the more I see how interconnected we all are as human beings. And I have met some of those who are crossing at our Southern border and I've heard their harrowing stories and their desperation and their courage to get themselves and their families out of their situation. And God has been working to remove my mask and transform my heart in the process. And God has been connecting me more deeply with Christ through my relationships with these beautiful human beings whom I have encountered. Reverend Santos, I wonder if you have any thoughts hearing that. I have a lot. <laughs> thank you for <laughs> thank you for um, for your vulnerability, uh, Bishop. I think that we need a lot more of that. And thank you for uh, for not only uh, pondering these things but uh, putting them into action. That's another principle of liberation theology that it always has to be connected to praxis to uh, to action. Um, I think that um, it is important for all of us to find our wells, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, what are those experiences that we have in our lives that allow for us to encounter uh, the other, uh, those that are very different uh, than us uh, and uh, allow us to, um, to get to know each other well? Uh, I think that that uh, involves uh, a little bit of uh, uh, honesty with ourselves. There's some things that we don't want to remember, some things that are painful uh, to remember. Um, it is also scary because to encounter the other uh, also means to be vulnerable. Uh, you don't know uh, uh, whether the other is going to reciprocate uh, your, uh, your reaching out uh, or your hand. Um, but I think that in our context uh, as uh, Lutheran followers of Christ, it is important that we, that we remember that this is a process that is led by the spirit. I think that it's important that we remember um, something uh, deep uh, in, the, in Luther's uh, thought. Uh, and it's the idea that the gospel operates in us as law and as gospel, which means that uh, first, uh, the law uh, reveals the mask to us. Uh, when we explore our wells, when we encounter the other one, it's like there's a mirror uh, that is put in front of us. And sometimes we don't like what we see, uh, but we got to remember that that is part of the healing process of the spirit. Uh, it is like the surgeon uh, with, the, uh, with the knife. And we got to remember that, yes, the knife uh, hurts, and it's going to cut, but it is it is the surgeon, and she has our 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 best interest in mind, and she is cutting us so that we can be healed. And so we need to understand that the one that confronts us uh, with our uh, uh, with our prejudices, uh, with the ways in which we have benefited from, uh, in the case that you said, for instance, from from, from your white skin, uh, white privilege. Uh, the ways in which we as a country have benefited uh, from the labor of others, uh, um, uh, both sla slave uh, labor uh, from the lands that were taken uh, from our American Indian uh, sisters and brothers who are still uh, with us, of course. Um, all those things are painful uh, to see, but that is the work of the law uh, uh, of the gospel. 
And, uh, and we need to remember that it comes from our loving God. And that the next step uh, is the word of healing, is the word of forgiveness, is the word of bringing about a new creation, a new community, the possibility of um, uh, having friends that you never imagined you'd be friends with, uh, possibilities for our country that we can only imagine or dream of. Uh, and imagine if we open ourselves up uh, to that work of the spirit, imagine the world that we would leave to our children and to our grandchildren. Wouldn't that be uh, wonderful? And so that is my word. Uh, my word is that, uh, my, my, my last reflection on this is that uh, it was not just uh, the woman uh, at the well that was able to experience the transformative power of, of Christ, but that we too can be that woman, that we too can experience that transformative power, both as individuals and, uh, and as a community. I really believe that God is doing something new. And, uh, and your synod uh, is an exciting place to be because I think that that is one of the places where it's happening, Bishop. So I pray for you, I pray for your synod. And, uh, and, I, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm honored and privileged uh, to be here with you all. Uh, what about you, Bishop? You have any, any final thoughts, any final words? Amen to all of that, Reverend Santos. I, for me, I just, I trust and I hope that God will continue to stir us up to be bold and courageous in the way in which we share this great news of the gospel with the others around us, just like that Samaritan woman did. Would you be willing to close us in prayer? Absolutely. Thank you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's take a moment uh, to be quiet, to be silent, to sit at the well, with Christ and to drink from those living waters that he promises us to come to us through the word. Gracious God, thank you for the gift of the gospel through which the living Christ comes to us like he did so many uh, so much so long ago uh, to the woman at the well and thank you for the living water that you promise to give us we pray that we may not resist uh, that living water that you want to give to us we pray that you may help us remove those masks that imprison us and that imprison our neighbors we pray that we may be bold enough uh, to believe uh, that you are about to do something new, that you are bringing about a new creation among us. We humbly pray that, that we may be uh, instruments of this work that you are doing, that uh, everything that we have it, that we are, uh, that you use, that uh, you bring forgiveness uh, to our hearts and to our lives, and that you bring healing to our country and to our uh, communities. We pray for those who are most vulnerable among us. And uh, uh, today, as we're recording this, I am also mindful of our siblings in India as they struggle with the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, may they feel your presence and may we know how to accompany them. And finally, I pray for the ministry of the Synod, for their bishop, and for their leaders, that they may continue to be guided by your spirit and offer bold leadership filled with faith and with love and with courage. All this we pray in the name of Christ, our Lord, our liberator. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bishop.
Apostles' Creed. God has made us one people through baptism into Christ. Living together in trust and hope, we are bold to confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us come before God in prayer. God of wholeness, we pray for believers all around the globe and for the community and the communion we share in Christ through the Lutheran World Federation, Lutheran World Relief, the Evangelical Church, Lutheran Church in America, and our Bishop Elizabeth. Unite us in service of the gospel that we may work together as beloved siblings to share your love with all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of the cosmos, we pray for creation, the gardens, waterways, and creatures near to us and forms of life that remain unseen. Teach us to treat the natural world with reverence seeking restoration when human divisions have caused harm to your beloved creation, blessed with renewing rain, the drought-stricken earth, guard and protect all in the path of storms, floods, and natural disasters. Lord, in your mercy. God of all people, we pray for harmony among the nations. Cast out from us unclean spirits of greed and fear, that we may work in solidarity with one another for the common good. Empower us as we face the crisis at our southern border and lift to your love and care those who labor and those who suffer there. Give us wisdom, strength, 
and courage to do what must be done to preserve the humanity and dignity of all who seek sanctuary, shelter, and safety in that place at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of grace, we pray for women, men, and children who are in need, for those who are ill, seeking health and healing in the midst of this ongoing pandemic, for those who are hungry or homeless, those estranged from family, friends, school, and social communities, those who suffer in these difficult economic times, Bless and protect medical care and, sta and staff, teachers and essential workers, community food and service agencies. Grant that all your people may come to know the fullness of this life. Lord, in your mercy. God of equity, we celebrate with the whole ELCA more than 50 years of service by ordained women. 40 years of service by ordained women of color, and 10 years of service by ordained LGBTQIA siblings. We give thanks for the unique gifts they bring to all your people. We pray for those being called to serve, those currently in preparation, and those awaiting call to ordain the word and sacrament or word and service ministry in this church. Give wisdom and guidance to students, seminaries, and candidacy committees. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of abundance, we pray for our Southwestern Texas Synod, our Bishop Susan, staff, congregations, pastors, deacons, vicars, Synod authorized ministers, lay leaders, and all those who join in this ministry. Strengthen and guide us as we continue to learn, to love, and to lead for the sake of your kingdom. We give thanks this day for the Reverend Dr. Judith Spent, her eight years of ministry among the people of the Southwestern Texas Synod as Director of Evangelical Mission and Bishop's Associate for Leadership. For the Reverend Dr. Javier Alanis, his 21 years of dedication to the mission of the Lutheran Seminary Program in the Southwest as a Professor of Theology and Executive Director. For Mr. Carl Tynert, his 13 years of service as Vice President of this Synod and for all those who give their time and talent to the mission and ministry that the Southwestern Texas Synod enables among congregations, conferences, ministries, and institutions within its borders. Lord, in your mercy. God of the ages, you surround the church with saints and holy ones to forever proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus. We praise you for those whose lives have touched our own and who now rest in you. Especially we give thanks for the lives of those rostered ministers who died recently. Pastors Helmer Kraus, Vernon Breakerts, Joe Garcia, Mel Sawyer, James Heineke, Wilbur Dorr, Walter Lentz, Deacon Virginia Wilcox, and all those that we name aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Give us your grace that on the last day we too may be brought into heaven's embrace and enfolded into the life of the Trinity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend all for which we pray, trusting in the power of your Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Thanksgiving for the Word. O God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Lord, Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
Go into the world to serve God with gladness. Share the good news. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Remember to no one, evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> 